Merry Christmas. Thank you for coming to Memories of My Messiah, our church's Christmas program. Did want to just go on and mention, just in the way of some announcements, that following the Christmas program tonight, there is a cookie fellowship downstairs. Cookies and hot chocolate and hot apple cider. And that's going to taste good on a chilly night. So I hope that each of you will be able to stay. Uh, again, immediately following the program, we'll have that. Also just want to recognize Jessica Kleeberger. And uh, Jessica Kleeberger, could you just wave your hand, Jessica? She's back there by the door. There she is. She has written this program tonight for our church. And in fact, um, I think this is like the sixth, maybe the seventh one in a row that she has written for our church. And so can we just give her a hand at this time? Thank you so much, Jessica. We really do appreciate that. At this time, I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. So good to see each of you here tonight. I know we have several visiting here, and so we're thankful that you're with us. So I'm going to open up in a, in a word of prayer, and then Jacob is going to come and lead us in a hymn before the program starts. Father, we're thankful for this time of the year when we can remember the reason for this season. It is about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can have a personal relationship with you, Heavenly Father, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask tonight, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, challenge us through this program, through your word, through these songs tonight. Help us to be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, we're thankful for the free gift of salvation you offer to everyone who will humble themselves, who will repent of their sin and put their faith in Christ alone for salvation. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us first. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Verses of joy to the world. We'll stand together as we sing number 87. <laughs>
I could never have dreamed then of the role that God would choose for me to fill in this broad, miraculous story of redemption. My morning had begun like any other, until an angel of the Lord appeared to me while I went about my daily duties. I nearly dropped the water vessel I was carrying. He saw my bewilderment and told me not to be afraid. His every word is carved into my memory to this day. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I had so, so many questions. And I asked you just one. I was espoused to Joseph, and I had been faithful to my covenant with him. How could I possibly be with child? He explained to me that I would bear a son through the power of the Holy Ghost. He would not be the son of any earthly man, but of God. He revealed to me that my elder cousin Elizabeth had finally conceived the son she had so longed and prayed for. Another miracle, which could only be of God. My heart leapt with joy as I imagined my cousin's happiness. For with God, the angel said, nothing shall be impossible. I am the handmaid of the Lord, I replied, my heart racing, my voice soft, but resolute. Be it unto me according to thy word. Us 
as the occasional small kick reminded me, most lovingly every step of the way. I was so grateful for his gentleness and his faith. He had believed the words of the angel and the miracle that had occurred, and he had stood by me steadfastly, despite the whispers, so not so quiet, and the looks of judgment. As we arrived in Bethlehem, all our thoughts were on a place to sleep, to wash our aching, dusty feet, and to have a nourishing meal. But our challenges were not over yet. With other travelers also returning to Bethlehem to pay their taxes according to Caesar's decree, no one had room to spare. Because there was no room for us, I gave birth to the Christ child in a stable. As I had seen the woman in my community do so often with gentle, capable hands, I wrapped my baby in swaddling clothes. Then I laid him in a manger. That night we were visited by shepherds, their eyes glowing, their hands practically trembling with excitement. There he is. They said, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. We were told we would find him so, the Messiah. They shuffled forward in quiet awe, dropping to their knees reverently. They told me and Joseph how an angel had brought them the wonderful tidings, then been joined by a heavenly host praising the birth of the Christ child. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The, shep the shepherds marveled over their story of a night in the dark fields, at first seemingly like any other, but suddenly lit up by the miraculous appearance of an angel. I thought back to the girl who had been preparing the daily meal when an angelic messenger brought her the same news. News that would turn an ordinary day into one that would redeem the world. The shepherds left the stable torn, reluctant to take their eyes off Jesus, but eager to share all that they had seen and heard. Jesus took him to the temple in Jerusalem for his dedication. 
following the laws of Moses. At the temple, an elderly man named Simeon asked if he could hold Jesus. His hands were gnarled, shaking, but grew steady as he gently took the baby into his arms. I recognized in him the same joy that had lit up the eyes of the shepherds that night in the stables. I was promised, he was free, that I would see him before I died. Lord, he prayed, you are letting your servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Joseph and I were amazed at Simeon's prayer and at the blessing he offered, at the weight of the words spoken through him. <coughs> Although Jesus was just a babe, we were already seeing the hopes and belief of faithful men and women fulfilled through him right in front of our eyes. Simeon turned to me, the joy in his voice tempered and seriousness. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will, will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus was later visited by the Magi, who had traveled a great distance to kneel before him with the same reverent awe of the shepherds and offered costly gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But it was quickly clear that not all were willing to kneel before the Christ child. When the wise men were warned by an angel in a dream not to reveal Jesus' location to King Herod, Herod issued a decree that all baby boys under two years of age should be killed. Joseph and I were forced to flee. I cradled Jesus close, grieving for the mothers who had lost their sons to man's wickedness and jealousy. And although I was blessed to still hold my child close, I remembered Simeon's prophecy that I would endure my own grief. From the time of Jesus' conception, I had dealt with doubt, with scorn, with judgment from those in my hometown who did not believe my story or the miracle that had occurred, did not believe I had been faithful. Those early years set the pattern of what was to be Jesus' life, that there would be those who reacted to him with hatred, envy, and disbelief, and dispersed with those who demonstrated deep devotion, love, and faith.
12 years of age, <laughs> he it gave us a good scare. We were traveling home after the Passover celebrations had concluded. Jesus was not by my side or Joseph's, but we believed that he was simply in the company of our relatives and neighbors, playing with the other boys his age. We realized, however, that Jesus was not with them. In fact, no one had seen him since we left Jerusalem. We traveled back to Jerusalem, finally finding him sitting in the temple and conversing with the temple leaders. To our surprise, they were all listening to his questions and answers intently, impressed with the depth of his knowledge and understanding. I scolded Jesus soundly for how he had worried us. Why did you seek me? he asked, his voice not petulant, but genuine. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I hugged him a little tighter, a little longer that night before bed, my heart offering a flutter as it remembered my fear earlier that day. To my surprise that night, he didn't offer his usual embarrassed protests, arguing that he, he was no longer a babe or tried to wiggle out of my embrace. Instead, he quietly rested his head on my shoulder. Although he was still a child, in so many ways, he was growing up. I couldn't cling to him, couldn't be selfish with this dear boy. I had been given to care for and love. God had not just given him to me, but to mankind. How could I wisely mother him, this child of 12 who already understood more of the will of God than the temple scholars who had devoted their lives to studying it? And although I had not grasped at that time fully what Jesus' journey would be, I knew that to go about his father's business in a broken, angry world would be a path of hardship. Oh, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. How can a mother bear to witness her child's pain? As they often did, the angel's words echoed in my heart, and I clung to them. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Number 102. Number 102 will sing all three verses of Jesus, Wonderful Lord.
Tears trickled down my cheeks. I thought of the many evenings when he had come in from play. Eyes bright, even in the dusk, as he told me of the day's adventures. I had tended his scraped knees, taken off his dusty stained garments, and helped him into cool, clean linen, granted requests for just one more sip of water, cradled him in my arms, and sang him off to sleep. And now, I could not brush the sweaty hair back from his eyes, could not dab the water from his parched lips, could not wash away the blood and bandage his wounds, could not hold him close. I was powerless to help him, and I knew with a deep ache in my soul that he would never have let me. He looked down at me, and my heart both broke and failed against the compassion I saw in them. Behold, your mother, he says to John. John glances at me, then back at him and nods. A promise. Jesus had said a few words throughout the day. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This day, you shall be with me in paradise mm. to the man hanging beside him, mm. nearly blind with pain, but finally seen. And now, behold, your mother. How dare he, gasping with shallow pained breaths, reach down to take some of my grief on his bowed, bruised shoulders. And yet, that was his purpose. I couldn't save my child. Because he had come to save the people who mocked and scorned him. To save the people who turned to him for grace in their final desperate moments. To save me. I wept for my son, who had the power to change the world, and yet the love to look at a single soul to look through the, the rivulets of his own blood and tears, to see them. I thought of the scriptures of Hagar wandering the wilderness, of a mother alone and carrying a burden. The memory of her words pierced my heart. I have seen the God who sees me.
the vast oceans and roaring storms and stars being carried inside a fragile human vessel, entering the world among all the blood, sweat, and tears that would follow with birthing his fully human stepbrothers, lying, unlike them, swaddled in a food trough, depending on human hands to carry him, to change his garments, to give him food. Looking back, I shudder at the thought of the responsibility laid on me. I felt the weight and gravity of motherhood then, too, of course, but perhaps not enough. The human mind can only hold a small picture of the fullness of God's mysteries, or else it would break. I grimace to think of the times I forgot this boy was not a mere child, that as a boy of 12, he knew more of the heart of God than his parents ever could. I see so much more clearly now, looking back, and I know firmly that there is so much more that my mind will not truly be able to embrace in its entirety until I am called home. But it soothes my spirit to remember now how God guided my steps and gave me grace every day. I think of my baby, my son, not just my son, but the son of the God of the universe, leaving the world as he had entered it. Sweat, blood, tears, human hands offering him vinegar and a crown of thorns. I imagine the grief and joy in heaven when he returned, bearing the marks of nails on his palms and scars on his sides, visible memories of his agony that could have easily been healed, but he kept them as a picture for humanity of the price he had paid for them, for us. Like how he led his disciples to remember his sacrifice with bread and wine. He understood the minds of humanity and our need to see, to relate, to compare, to push, to have the mysteries of God brought into our daily lives. I weep still at the reminder of his pain, for the need that brought him to earth to endure death. But I dry my tears because I know those scars are a reminder of his triumph. My son, the son of God, is sitting at the right hand of his father. And I thank God for the great honor he bestowed on me to bring my savior into the world that night so long ago in Bethlehem.
was to remind each of us of the reason we celebrate Christmas. And um, Paul said in Colossians that we are to set our affection on the things that are above, not on the things of this world. And I hope tonight that your affections have truly been set on the things that are above. Uh, this is a joyous time of year. For Christians, we are to give thanks, we are to have hearts filled with gratitude, and for those that do not yet know the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the time is now to receive him, to turn from our sin and put our faith alone in what Christ did for us. I want to just take a few moments tonight to remind us that real peace is not based on our circumstances. I want to remind us tonight that real peace is based on a person. Real peace is based on a person. And that person's name is, of course, the subject matter of tonight's program, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, that is the name of Christ, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We're going to focus tonight just on one of those names, the Prince of Peace. Of course, Isaiah wrote this prophecy over 700 years before Jesus was born, before the Messiah had arrived, that is the anointed one. The Messiah had always been the eternal Son of God, but he came in the flesh as Jesus, the Christ child. Passage in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 speaks of a couple of different things. It speaks, of course, of the Messiah's being human, but also God. At the same time, God in the flesh. And it also, as I have read, it also reveals some of the Messiah's names. Names in the Bible describe a person's character. And so Christ, again, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And again tonight, I submit to you that real peace is not based on our circumstances. Real peace is based on a person, and that person's name is Jesus Christ. And I wonder tonight, are you at peace? Spiritually speaking, are you at peace? Augustine famously said, our souls are restless until we find our rest in Him. We also know that God in the Bible is described as the God of peace. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So when we're talking about peace tonight, peace from what? Peace from war? Peace from political unrest? Peace from enemies? When Jesus came, many... In the first century, he thought that that's why he came. He came to deliver us, the Jewish people, from Roman tyranny. He came to relieve us all from the oppression that we are currently facing. But that's not why Jesus came. Luke 19.10 describes why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus provides peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. Why is he called this? Because Jesus provides peace between God and men through his death on the cross. The Bible speaks clearly in Isaiah 59, 2 and other passages as well that our sins have separated us from God. All of us, every single one of us in the world are born in sin. And that is traced all the way back to Genesis in the Garden of Eden when Eve partook of that fruit and Adam ate as well. They sinned against God. God told them not to eat. And because of their sin, Romans 5.12 says, all of their sin was passed down to us. And that is a tremendous problem. 
that we all have to deal with, that we all have to face. But here, Jesus, again in Isaiah 9, 6, is described as the Prince of Peace. And so everyone has been affected by the sin curse. And this is why God had to send someone to rescue us, someone to redeem us, to buy us back. Everyone at birth, as I mentioned, is on, is on our way to hell. We're destined for hell. But God, out of his love for you, sent someone to procure our salvation. He sent us a rescuer. He sent us someone to redeem us. We're not, we're not saved. We don't go to heaven because of good works. We don't go to heaven by being a Baptist or any other denomination. We don't go to heaven by being baptized. Real peace is based on a person. Real peace is based on a person. We're talking about spiritual peace tonight. We're not talking about being free from turmoil, free from problems. None of us will ever be free from problems because of the, the curse way back in Genesis. And so because of the curse from Genesis, we are all cursed. And God knew that. And God sent us the way that we can be rescued. He sent us a way to be saved. And if you're drowning and if someone throws you a life preserver, you've got a decision to make. And the right decision is to reach out and grab that preserver. You can't say, you know what, I think I can get to shore on my own strength. I don't think I need that life preserver. I don't think I need the helicopter that's overhead dropping down a rope for me to be saved. I can do it myself. God has provided the way. If drowning, the way comes through a rope, through a preserver, through some means. And there's that way. You've got to make that choice. I have to accept that. I can't save myself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For the, for the, grace of, uh, for the gift of God, for the grace of uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there's the sin problem. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you at peace tonight with God? This verse tells us how we can be. Being justified, that's God, instantaneously declaring you righteous, like a judge with a gavel, right? Instantaneously, the verdict is done. And when this word justified is brought out in this verse, it means to be declared righteous by faith. And through that, we can have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, what He did on the cross. Jesus said it like this. What do we need to do? Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus said, Repent and believe the gospel. Repent of your sins. Acknowledge that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. And put your faith, believe, that's trust, right? Believe in what Jesus Christ accomplished for you. Everything's done. He did it all. All the prophecies were fulfilled through Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Repent and believe the gospel. And that would be my encouragement for you tonight if you have not already done so. And I know many, probably most of us have. But you're here tonight for a reason. God brought you here for some reason. You were maybe invited by someone in our church. I don't know. But it's God's will that all of us are here right now tonight. Have you repented of your sins? Have you put your faith and trust in what God's Son, the Messiah, the Anointed One, has done for you? Jesus promises lasting peace. In fact, before He was crucified, He told His 12 apostles in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Stop right there. The world oftentimes promises peace that will not last. They promise peace, but it doesn't last like what Jesus promises his apostles and he promises us as well. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. That's transitory peace. It's not lasting. Let not your heart be troubled, he told his apostles. Neither let it be afraid. The peace of God is also mentioned 
In Philippians 4 and verse 7, Paul writes, <clears throat> in prison, going through a tremendous trial for being a preacher of the gospel, circumstances, well, very peaceful, right? In prison. But he's able to write in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep, that means it's going to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Are you at peace with God? If so, then, that peace of God is going to translate into your day-to-day -day life. Christians who, who have experienced peace with God can also have the peace of God. They experience the peace with God through believing, through faith in Christ alone for salvation. And then that peace is with them for the rest of our lives. And it, it blows the mind. It passes all understanding, all human comprehension. The peace that God alone can give us when we face the trials of this world. Prince of peace is Jesus Christ. He provided peace between God and man. The scripture says that he's the only mediator between God and men. Have you experienced his peace? Prince of Peace offers each of us peace tonight. And it comes by admitting again that we have sinned. We've sinned against this love of his, right? You admit that sin and you call out in faith for God to save you. And he will because real peace is based on a person. And that person's name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And Christian, He is able to give you peace throughout our lives. He's able to give us the peace that is mind-boggling to the world. How we can be at peace. And that's because we know the Prince of Peace. We put our faith and trust in Him. And now we are allowing that peace that comes alone from Him to guard our minds and hearts. And so we're focused on thinking His thoughts. We're focused on thinking what He wants us to think about, on dwelling on Him, on dwelling on eternity, as I've already mentioned, on setting our affections on the things that are above and not on the things of this world. Praise God for Jesus Christ, the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. If you don't have a relationship with God tonight through our Lord Jesus Christ, if your soul is restless, as Augustine said, I want to encourage you to talk to someone tonight. Talk to someone tonight. Talk to me. We have uh, gospel literature in the back. We have a little track. It's entitled True Peace. True Peace. These are available in the foyer. Gospel tracts are available if you would like to do a Bible study with someone in our church if you just have some questions and, and uh, maybe you're not ready yet to believe. You've got a lot of questions first. That's okay. But we want to help you with that. Would you allow us maybe to do a Bible study with you to, to meet together so that we can discuss this further? Real peace is based on a person. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for memories of my Messiah. Lord, I believe it has truly drawn our thoughts to Christ and what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And Father, I pray tonight for each one in this building, Lord, that you would work in our hearts. Lord, if there's anyone, you know the hearts, I do not. But if there's anyone here and they've never put their faith and trust in Christ alone to save them, please convict them, Lord. And please help them to turn in faith alone tonight to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to the Prince of Peace. And Father, for Christians who are here tonight, I know there are many. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to allow the peace of God to guard our hearts and minds. Satan wants to discourage us with his lies. He constantly lies to believers. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to put on the full armor of God that we might be able to stand. And I ask, Father, that you would be with the remainder of our time tonight. We thank you for the refreshments that we are about to have downstairs. I thank you again for each uh, one who, 
who's uh, visiting tonight with us. We pray that each of us, Lord, would remember you this time of the year and that we would be grateful for your unspeakable gift of salvation to us. Lord, help us to be eternally grateful for all of the blessings that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. And everyone is invited downstairs to our cookie fellowship. We hope that you'll be able to stay tonight. Thank you so much for coming. You're dismissed.